coming to you live from Love Television Studios in Belize City. This is the evening news for today, Wednesday, June 1st. We'll get started with the leading stories for today. African, Caribbean and Pacific heads of state and government reiterate support for Belize in relation to the Guatemalan claim. People's United Party comments on IMF report. Taxi man murdered in Belmopan, Belize. Prosecution presents case in Calony Flowers murder trial. The Rotary Club of Belize hands over house and Social Security Board celebrates anniversary. The African, Caribbean and Pacific heads of state and government convened for their eighth summit in New Guinea yesterday. The summit held under the theme repositioning the ACP group to respond to challenges of the sustainable development has representation from Belize through its Minister of Foreign Affairs, Wilfred Elrington, and His Excellency Dylan Vernon, Belize's ambassador to the European Union. The summit closed today with the adoption of a declaration which covers issues relating to the work and the way forward of the ACP. The government of Belize issued a press release highlighting paragraph 18 of the declaration, which focuses on the support for Belize during the Guatemalan claim. The paragraph states, quote, Recalling the resolution at the 103rd session of the ACP Council of Ministers, we strongly reaffirm unequivocal support for Belize's sovereignty and territorial integrity in relation to ongoing tensions along the border of Belize caused by the Republic of Guatemala's persistent territorial claims. We call on the government of the of the Republic of Guatemala to respect the borders of Belize as established in the 1859 treaty and move with urgency to agree on protocols for the use of the Sarstoon River on the southern border of Belize. We urge both governments to refrain from the threats or the use of force to respect international agreements and to move with expedition to hold national referenda with the goal of submitting all Guatemala's claims to the International Court of Justice for final resolution. We renew our call on the international community, including the European Union, to support the efforts of Belize and the Republic of Guatemala to seek a peaceful, final and just resolution to Guatemala's claims and in particular to support the facilitation work of the Organization of American States through its office in the adjacency zone. End of quote. The hurricane season begins today. The official season spans through November which simply encompasses the majority of storms during an average year. It doesn't necessarily catch all of the hurricane activity. In mid-January, there was the first hurricane of the season, Hurricane Alex, and just this past weekend, Tropical Storm Bonnie formed. Love News visited the National Meteorological Service headquarters, where we sat down with Chief Meteorologist Dennis Gongwes, who gave us an insight of what we can expect this season. Some institutions have produced some outlooks, projections for the season, and some of them indicate that the season will be average or slightly above average. Um, in, uh, the activity will be slightly above average, average to slightly above average during this hurricane season. Um, in terms of the number of named systems, um, they are predicting somewhere between 12 and 16 named systems. The average from 1981 to 2010 is about 12. So they are predicting average to above average um, number of named systems. And the uh, forecast for um, hurricanes um, lies between 4 and 8, and the average is about 6. So again, we're just about average to above average in that, in that category. Last year, the hurricane season seemed a bit quiet and there were not only any threats. However, that was because the El Nino phenomenon that was around. It slowed down the development of hurricane activities. Ganges says this year there will be no El Nino. The predictions are for between one and four major hurricanes. That is category three, four, and five. The average for that is about two to three. So we, we're just about average to above average home activity in this hurricane season. Compared to last year, the conditions that were around that caused such a relatively quiet season, all that will change by the Ju end of July to, to end of uh, mid-August, all that will change. So we will not have the same conditions around that caused that quiet season, relatively quiet season last year.
And finally, we had um, Bonnie. We had Bonnie, um, Bonnie farming out in by, by near to the um, United States, um, um, southeastern United southeastern United States. So we've had two early season um, storms so far with Alex earlier in January, and then now Bonnie um, last week. So. Already the season is ramping up and um, we haven't started as yet. So we're looking at um, uh, 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 about a little bit above average se um, season this year. The, like I said, the El Nino phenomenon that was around, the warm Pacific Ocean that caused the quiet season over, over this side, that will decay. That will decay by, by, by August. So then um, we can look forward to a uh, rather um, active season. Above average um, activity. Agonga spoke about preparedness techniques that should have been in place for family and businesses months ago. So months ago, we should have started preparing, um, stocking up on on, on canned goods, um, knowing which shelter you you will you will you will go to when when the hurricane when when the weather threatens, um, when will, when will, what time will you leave your home to head to the shelter? You don't want to be get caught between the, your home and the shelter in a, in a long line of traffic or something that you cannot reach the shelter in time. So all that you need to have within your your your, your hurricane emergency plan. Well, what all would you take to the shelter? Not only canned goods, you have to take other other um, other necessities such as um, your like your house paper, important papers. You know, you have to medications. You have to plan all that. What what you will take to the shelter? When you will leave? When when will, when will you leave home to head to the shelter so that you don't get caught out in the storm? So um, it's preparedness is the most important thing. You have to be ready because we don't know which when and where the system will make landfall. The hurricane season ends at the end of November. The City Emergency Management Organization and the Belize City Council held a press conference to discuss strategies and the updated work of NEMO and SEMO for the hurricane season. Mayor Darrell Bradley addressed the media about the theme that they will work under. One of the major themes that we would want to open this press conference with is the importance of coordination, collaboration, partnership, and spreading information, especially to members of the public. We talk about things like a family plan. We talk about things like individual responsibility, and those things are very, very critical in terms of an emergency. I also want to recognize our leaders in-house on CIMO. Of course, we know that CIMO is the City Emergency Management Organization uh, by way of a ceremonial position. I am the head of CIMO, but the actual work is carried out quite extensively by Councillor Philip Willoughby, who is really the operational head as the councillor with responsibility for CIMO, and he does the day-to-day -day work, including uh, ensuring that the meetis, meetings are functioning, including ensuring that the subcommittees are working and ensuring that information is spread to the council for immediate policy decisions. Mayor Bradley spoke about the collaboration of different entities to have better shelters and emergency response. We've had various uh, strategic planning meetings from January to today's date to set out a calendar of activities. Recently, they completed the inspection of all hurricane shelters. The listing of shelters in Belize on the north side and the south side is produced by the city council so that we have that list. We also have that information on our city council website. We advise persons just to check out the list so that you are able to know where is the nearest hurricane shelter in your area. All that inspection and making sure that it's ready has been completed. It was completed since February 10th of 2016, that was done in collaboration with NEMO, with SEMO, and with other stakeholders. We've gotten significant support over the years from the Red Cross in relation to ensuring that these hurricane shelters are up to date. I know that NEMO and SEMO have been working, nationally NEMO has been working in relation to ensuring that the accommodations are a little bit better. Of course, when you're thinking about a hurricane, you are not thinking about comfort. 
you are thinking about protection and safety and security. But I know that NEMO, uh, together with the other areas, including CMO, have been working on issues like upgrading bathrooms and different things like that to make it a little bit more comfortable in the event that people have to go into shelters. A councillor, Philip Willoughby, who is in charge of CMO, spoke about their efforts to strengthen their capabilities. For the last four years is to continue building capacity and strengthening of our capabilities and that is our focus. I'd like to take this opportunity also to say thank you officially now as the head of, as the council responsible for CMO for the $10.75 million invested in the flood mitigation project in the Belama phase one, two, two, four project. The residents of Belize City were the direct benefactors from this project, including the Douglas Jones area, which will alleviate tremendously the, fo the flooding and the impacts from the rains, etc., during this upcoming season and future seasons. Also, as a beneficiary, from the project, the Belize City Council will build its capability through equipments and assets that will be purchased through the project in the tune of about a million dollars approximate in US, including shed to house and shelter these assets. A murder has been reported in Belmopan. Love News got the details from officer in charge of Belmopan Police, Senior Superintendent Howell Gillett. Sometime after 1 p.m. today, we received information that there might have been a um, possible murder in the area of West Belmopan, which is adjacent to the Rivera area. And our officers proceeded to that area and indeed confirmed that there was a male person who we later learned to be um, who was seen with gunshot wounds to the abdomen and to the head. Um, this, what we know is that this person was last seen sometime after 9 p.m. last night. And he left from an area to go home and the discovery was made, as I alluded to earlier, sometime after 1 p.m. today. As we speak, here's a postmortem on the way and that should um, give us a better idea of what might have occurred. He was found at the steps of his um, home, but the area is extremely um, isolated. But we are conversing as much as we could from the, um, from the neighbors to see what they might have seen or heard sometime between last night and when we made the discovery. I can't say um, much at this time by virtue of the fact that the investigation is, it has just started. Um, our database is showing that, um, you know, we, we haven't had any complaint from him or anybody um, being up any trouble to him. So he came in as a surprise to us. According to a family member, Jillet's mother was trying to reach him on the phone and did not get any response. She asked someone to check on him and that was when the discovery was made. We understand a number of items were taken from the home. Closing arguments were heard today in the case against Calony Flowers, accused of hitting the, the motorcycle of her ex-boyfriend and his new girlfriend. The defense, represented by attorney Dickie Bradley, argued that the four witnesses presented by the prosecution were faulty and argued that their testimonies were not credible. Two of these are statements given by police officers at the scene after the incident. They defy common sense because if you see, you see a red car pick up speed, heavy speed, come with a massive force to hit, uh, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know about motorcycle, 600cc ninja bike with two occupants on it, with such force that you can send that motorbike flying 65 feet till it bounces into the pickup at the gate of the church and the occupants be flung the distances I told you. Come on, man, it would have to be some kind of force to cause that. But we had the photographs of the car taken by the police shortly after the accident and the day afterwards. And there's not a scratch, not a dig, not a dent. 
no tire mark to the front, the license plate is right there, nothing, and this is a small car. One of the strongest points the defense put forth was that Flowers' car, which is presumed to be the murder weapon, sustained no damages to suggest that it ever collided with the motorcycle. Co-counsel Arthur Saldiva spoke with Love News about how much the defense is hinging on the car evidence. The car is the case. The case is the car. It's like with the OJ trial, you know, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. The car is the case. If they cannot show, and I don't believe from the evidence they showed that the car was involved in a high-speed collision, you cannot say then that Miss Flowers did anything with her car. Remember, she was driving the car. The, 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 the case is not that she reached out from inside the car and grabbed Mr. Morrison's clothes and pulled them off the bike. That's not the case. The case is not that she hung her hand and frightened him and he fell. The case is that he, she took the car, used it as a battering ram, and rammed the cycle with the car. That's the case. So if that is not there, if the car doesn't show that that happened, the rest is up to you. It has been four years that Kalani Flowers is at the Colby Foundation. Saldiva spoke about her condition as a lupus patient. Ms. Flowers is a person who uh, has lupus. She is a lupus patient. Um, it has not been easy on her um, being where she is. Um, she has maintained from the inception of this matter that she is, she is innocent. And there is nothing that has transpired in the court to lead me to believe otherwise. Um, so we are hoping at this point that with everything that has been said, with everything that has been brought before the court, that she will be in a position thereafter to resume her normal life. After the prosecution submitted their final arguments, the judge stated that he would be reviewing the case and returning with the verdict sometime next week. Last week, we told you of the preliminary report coming out of the assessment team of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, in which it has stated that the country's economic outlook has worsened. Yesterday, we brought you the interview with Senator Godwin Hulls, where he told Love News, this is not by far the worst we have been. We have seen far worse than this. In fact, it is better now than it used to be. End of quote. Well, today, the People's United Party has weighed in and, according to their release, the recent IMF Article 4 consultation confirmed the dismissal state of Belize's economy under the UDP. The opposi opposition continued by stating, quote, While the UDP government has been unable to truthfully explain the economic realities to the Belizean people, in his budget presentation, party leader Honorable John Brasenio signaled that hard times were upon us. Our country is in an economic crisis as a result of the UDP's excessive and unsustainable borrowing and spending. To mitigate recession, the IMF is saying to the UDP that it must cut government expenditures and contain the public sector wage bill while broadening the tax base and implementing tax reforms. In other words, that means retrenchment of public officers and further raising of taxes on hard-working Belizeans. The People's United Party has consistently reminded the government of the repercussions of it, the mismanagement of the economy. The IMF report release is testament of the warnings of the PUP. Belizeans will now have to wake up to the sad reality. After the election party of 2015 using borrowed money, that we have been tricked and that we have been and have harder times ahead under this UDP government." End of quote. Over the next five weeks, 190 villages from around the country will be holding village council elections in all six districts. With the next general election not due until the year 2020, the borough administration remains in control and with that, very few villages will be contested by the main opposition. Love News understands that the leader of the opposition, John Persenio, is making his rounds around the country, meeting with interested slates for the upcoming elections while he is backing a few. It won't be much of a contested event in the rural areas. The first set of elections is slated for Sunday, June 5th, and those will take place 
in seven villages in the Corozal district, namely Calcutta, Ranchito, San Joaquin, Carolina, San Pedro, Cristo Rey, and Yo Chen. In the Orange Walk District Village, council elections will take place in San Lazaro, Trinidad, Tower Hill, San Antonio, and Santa Cruz for the Belize District. Elections are stated at the villages of Mascal, Bomba, Boston, Corzalito, Lucky Strike, Rockstone, Pond, Santana, St. Anne's, and Gales Point. In the Cayo District, the villages are Valley of Peace, Unitedville, Black Man Eddy, Crystal Ray, and for the Stan Creek District, the villages are Independence, Placencia, Santa Cruz, Maya Center, and City River. Meanwhile, the Toledo District will see village council elections taking place for Big Falls, Boom Creek, Cattle Landing, Elridge Village, Forest Home, Santa Ana, Aguacate, Blue Creek, Mabilha, Mafredi, San Benito, Poit, Santa Teresa, and Jordan. In village council elections, the chairman of the alcalde is the head, while six persons are elected to serve. Activities to celebrate Belize's Social Security's 35th anniversary took place today in Punta Gorda. Paul Mahong has the story. Punta Gorda branch service manager Yvonne Price told Love News here that activities began at the Social Security Punta Gorda branch office compound with a 7 a.m. religious service officiated by Reverend Tanya Welcome of Toledo Methodist Churches. Activities continued with Customers Open Day, highlighting educational booths focusing on registration of employers and employees, contributions and benefits offered, and free blood pressure check and glucose tests, courtesy of kind volunteers of Hillside Healthcare Center. Yvonne Price also confirmed that the Social Security Punta Gorda branch gift package to mother of the first born baby at Punta Gorda Hospital on June 1 and 35th anniversary of Belize Social Security went to mother Salita Uk of Elridgeville Village. Other activities at Belize Social Security Punta Gorda branch office included servings of snacks and refreshments to customers who at the end of the day one will be the lucky winner of a food hamper with a variety of nutritious items. Reporting for Love News, Paul Mahong, Punagorda. The 2016 sugarcane crop is coming to an end. In the 25th week of the season, the factory is reporting a continued improvement in cane quality. For the week ended May 29th, 47,274 tons of cane was ground, which resulted in 5,675 tons of sugar. The improvement in the quality of cane has seen an improvement in the tons of cane per tons of sugar, which was 8.33. A two-bedroom bungalow wooden home was handed over to Tanisha Plunkett, a mother of four this morning in the Port Loyola area of Belize City. The Rotary Club, with support from fellow Rotarians in Canada, were the ones who provided the funding of about $22,000 to complete this undertaking. Tessa Usher is the president of Rotary Club, and according to her, it is all about how the clubs can help and who really needs the help. You know that one of the services that the Rotary Club of Belize offers is the house building project. Each year, depending on the funding that comes in, we would choose recipients, needy recipients that um, need a home. That, um, how, we, how we go about choosing those recipients, we have a committee a house building project committee and after we have chosen the recipient that goes to the board the board approves or ratifies and then we we would proceed with the project for that particular person how we identify with the most needy person we look at the the income of that person the capable the ability of that person um, with their work and their their children in this case Tanisha was chosen because she had nowhere to go. She had challenges in terms of placing her kids in one particular area. She had them at different locations each day um, to sleep. And they are all under the age of four years old. And so we thought that that was one of the most urgent needs to keep the entire family together herself and her four children. She had them placed with different family members. 
The house was built in parts by the inmates at the Colby Foundation and transported to the land on Q&S Street. The land belongs to Plunkett's mother and the club had gotten authorization to place the structure on it. Plunkett says she is excited and is now desperately seeking employment to care for her children. Excited, really, really excited, thankful. Words can begin to describe how happy I am. Truly happy. Okay, and you're planning to move in when? When the guys finish, they're almost finished, so probably tomorrow or Friday. Desperately looking. It's been rough these past couple months being a single mom, taking care of four kids. It's been really, really hard trying to find a job, unable to find one at the moment. So this is like a blessing. The Rotary Club of Belize is in dialogue with the Belize Electricity Limited and the Belize Water Services to get the utilities installed at no charge. The house took about six days to be constructed and was handed over with bunk bed frames, stove and other pieces of furniture. Her Excellency Perla Perdomo, non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Ireland today, presented her letters of credence to, presidency, to President His Excellency Michael D. Higgins at the President's residence. During her visit, Ambassador Perdomo had the opportunity to have private conversations with President Higgins and officials of the Irish Foreign Ministry, where she briefed the group of the current situation between Belize and Guatemala and spoke about areas of cooperation. Ambassador Perdomo is Belize's first ambassador to the Republic of Ireland. She is also the resident High Commissioner of Belize to the United Kingdom. Today began the celebrations for fishermen across Belize. This month is being celebrated as Fisher Folk Month to celebrate one of the main stakeholders of the fishing sectors. Today saw the opening ceremony for the celebration at the BTL Park, which encompassed a number of different organizations portraying the importance of fishermen in Belize. Fisheries Administrator Beverly Wade spoke to Love News about the importance of the month. It's a month-long um, activities to now look at fishermen, look at the role that they play in our national economy, look at the role they play in terms of our culture, and in general the role that they play in our communities and the society on a whole. They're a group of industrious citizens in Belize that we tend to overlook. Um, we buy our fish at Vernon Street, but we don't necessarily um, pay attention to what it entails from a fisherman perspective in engaging in fishing and producing um, such an important um, protein source for us at the end of the day. A number of organizations were present as well, such as Oceana, Digicel, Smart, the Belize Audubon Society, and Tropigas. Wade told us about the importance of having these organizations involved. Along with us today are a number of our partners, both from the conservation sector, um, you have people from regulatory agencies, but also from, from the corporate um, sector who um, recognizes the importance of fishermen. They are our partners in management and our partners in terms of the important commercial role that fishermen play in Belize. One of the key issues that the fisheries department is focusing on is managed access for fishermen. In Belize, we have a small scale fishery here in Belize and at the end of the day, we are very keen on putting in place a regime which speaks to long term sustainability. One of the important things that we have done in Belize, and I don't think it has been highlighted enough, is that for the first time since the beginning of time in Belize, we have moved from an open access fishery to now a structured fishery where we now have a well-defined approach as to how fishermen access the resource out there. Um, we refer to it as our managed access program, which is exactly what it was. It's to put in a framework to manage how fishermen now access the resources out there. We have successfully licensed fishermen in Belize um, to turfs, what we refer to as turf, but they're really fishing areas. And so we now have the ability to now strengthen the management regime saying we know exactly who is fishing where what they are fishing and it's an opportunity for us to now more constructively engage the fishers who are fishing in Belize. 
Wade says their new focus will be turning to the supply and value chains to ensure the fishermen can become involved in better markets to improve revenues. Today, 26 men received weed whackers after being successful applicants in an economic development equipment and capacity building program. The councillors chose two applicants each who they thought were deserving of the donation. Today, the men visited the city hall where they were presented with the certificate and their weed whacker. Mayor Darrell Bradley spoke about the importance of the program and the donations. I think that today is a good day for promoting empowerment in the city. We are dealing with several different issues. We are dealing with sanitation. We are dealing with the need to provide opportunities for young people within our city. We are dealing with the need to ensure that our city is more beautiful. And it is so impressive that several of our councillors could have come together with an initiative like this. I really want to salute Councillor Michael Tios, who is the councillor with responsibility for economic development, who suggested the idea in relation to our distributing weed walkers to young people. I want to salute Councillor Dion Leslie, who has responsibility for sanitation, for really jumping on board big time to say that, well, if our city needs to be cleaner, is there a way where we can provide opportunities for young people to help in that charge and at the same time make a little money? Each machine cost $1,500. Mayor Bradley says that the machines were purchased using public funds. The City Council likewise is partnering with several organizations including the Small Business Development Center. We are programming with Bell Trade and also with our Carolet unit in Belize City to provide training in terms of how you run a small business, how you can market yourself as a young entrepreneur, how you can deal with ensuring that you are able to use this weed walker even though it's a small gift you're able to use the weed walker in the way that it was intended, that it provides you with a sustainable and meaningful job. Each of these giftings costs approximately $1,500. It's not cheap. It was procured with public funds, and it is something that is the responsibility of the city council to ensure that we don't waste public funds. Two of the recipients, Kendall Sanchez and Martin Usher, spoke to Love News about their donations. The program, because I, I hear about it, and well, what I hear about it, I like it, so I just say, well, no, nothing bad, so just blessing, I do it. And I have nothing else to do, so just blessing, I do it. And I just accept what I do, so. I appreciate what they do for me and what they give me right now. I'm thankful for that. Mr. Willoughby, he um, called me and told me uh, he wants to better my life. So come on down here for this presentation, which I did. I'm interested in it too. And do exactly what the mayor said to do. You know, use it wisely, take care of it. And I could build from there. And I would try to attend uh, most of the... Uh, um, good venues that he mentioned that I could use for small businesses. Last week, Monday, Belizean-American Kyler Jackson and his one-year-old daughter Kaylee Jackson were reported missing. Reports are that Jackson was heading to Sacramento, driving but never reached his destination. In the area of Walnut Grove, officials began searches which led to the discovery of Jackson's vehicle in the Georginia Slope. Jackson was found dead in the slough Saturday afternoon and the body of one-year-old baby Kaylee Jackson was recovered the next day, a third of a mile north from where the man's body was located. Jackson is believed to have drowned after he lost control of his vehicle and plunged into the water. Over the weekend, Love News headed to the border to investigate whether the Belize-Guatemala conflict is affecting the businesses and their opinions on how their government is negotiating the conflict between the two countries. 
sí, la verdad, sí, porque eh, como le decía, ¿no? casi como el 60-70% de nuestros clientes son levelices. Y siempre son bien constantes y gastan y todo. Y ahora por el temor, no vienen. Entonces sí, ha bajado bastante el negocio, no solo a mí, en general también. El negocio de ropa, comida, bebidas, de todo, todo. Sí, bastante. Yes, a lot, because of all that, that they don't let lesions cross, and it's affecting commerce a lot. A todos nos afecta. Claro que sí. Of course, right now, not many lesions are coming here, only a few of them. Well, He estado viniendo. Bastante de salida. A lot of people used to come to shop here, you could see a lot of people, taxis used to come full, and now the place looks empty. Vacío todo. A los negocios tal vez... Tal Businesses maybe have been affected because around 15 days Belizeans have stopped coming to shop here. So normally on Saturday... Belizeans a comprar aquí. Normalmente nosotros acá... Affected over there in their government. And we over here are suffering because we cannot feed our families. We would earn around 300 to 400 quetzales. Now we barely earn 100 to 150. Como 100, 150 quetzales. The day after we visited the, ordering, the bordering commercial town, Guatemalan citizens held a demonstration to protest the death of the miner who died in the Chiquibul forest during a violent encounter between Guatemalan farmers and the BDF a few weeks ago. Chairman Rudy Escobar and villagers of Franks Eddy along with the business community warmly welcomed this morning Senior Superintendent Howell Juliet, Inspector Santiago Pat and his team of officers into the village of Franks Eddy. According to Superintendent Juliet, this is their eighth visit in Cayo South. We were happy to be in um, Franks Eddy. There were four general concerns coming out of the village and it had to do with um, strange people, the sighting of strange people in the, in the village. We did an investigation while we were there and we found out that it was seasonal workers who were um, reaping oranges from the different farms in that area. A very crucial issue that they brought up was there was uh, the non-existence of potable water for about six days in the village. They, they normally get water from the Belize Water Services. I immediately contacted the BWS and I learned that um, the, the problem was because of the, the low water from the river. So BWS is working diligently to redirect pipes to deeper areas of the river in that village and we have been promised that within the next three days or so um, Frank said should have water again. The other um, concern that was brought up was that of more police presence. Um, that's a generic concern throughout all the villages that we've been. We, we're doing our best with the, the numbers we have but I believe we could do a bit better in terms of having motorcycle patrols, especially on the weekends and, and on PADs. So that will occur. The other issue that was brought up is an area that has been used by young people to congregate to, for the use of drugs and other illegal activities. Um, we've met with the um, council, the village council, and we've agreed that next week at an unannounced date we will have the Kobe Foundation inmates come in and clear that entire area to make it safer for residents of that um, area. This next concern is not um, just for Frank City but for the other villages within the um, Kaya district that we police. It's the issue of wildfires. It's a generic concern to all the villages what are some of the safety tips that the, the police um, had in place to address those concerns? Well, what we've been telling people, and I, I'm happy for this opportunity to say it again, is that um, if we're doing slash and burn, that it's very um, um, prominent in this area. We want to make fire pass before we burn. We want to also contact the fire service before we do any slash and burn so that they could be on standby in, in case the, the need for um, the outing of the fire. We also ask the public to report immediately the sighting of any unattended or out of control fires. We beg that you do not discard cigarettes, 
matches or any other incendiary materials from moving vehicles. We also ask that you avoid backyard burning, especially in windy days. And if it's, a, if it's an extreme necessity, then we ask that you keep a shovel, water and fire retardant nearby to keep fires in check. This is Brother Fem Cruz reporting from the nation's capital city, Belopan, for Love FM. Workshops and trainings for women who aspire for political life are nothing new to Belize, particularly since there has been the lobbying for gender equality and women empowerment. One organization that has been moving from district to district engaging women in several sessions is the Belize Women Political Caucus through the development of Belizean Women into Politics Project funded by the British High Commission. According to a release from the BWPC, they have held six development of Belizean Women in Politics projects events in May in the various districts. The final session took place yesterday in Punta Gorda where high school students with an interest in politics were hosted at a seminar followed by discussions with the women who have been elected to political office. There was also the opening of the Women in Politics exhibition. The goals of the project is to increase public awareness and understanding surrounding the importance of women and politics as well as Belize's past and present women in politics. Crispin Jeffries is the chief transport officer and has had that position since 2012. However, his new replacement announced that Jeffries would be stepping down. At this time, we are uncertain if Jeffries' contract was not renewed, but Tirso Galvez, who is currently the operations officer of transport, made the announcement at City Hall. I'm presently the operations officer for the Department of Transport. And actually, um, in, regard, in respect to national transport and evacuation, I am also the national liaison officer. Um, I must say at this point that um, the chief transport officer, who is Mr. Crispin Jeffries, is the chairman for the transport and evacuation committee however mr jeffries will be stepping out um, and i shall be taking up his um, post as the chief transport officer effective the 4th of june so that would make me then the, the chairman for the national transport and evacuation committee the change comes into effect on june 4th the Miss Belize pageant will be returning to the country after four years. Opal Enriquez, coordinator of the pageant, spoke to us about the event. Uh, we had a press conference here today to, um, to reintroduce Miss Belize to the Belizean public. Uh, we are the organization that has held the franchise since 2012, which is Queen of the Jewel Limited, myself and my two partners, Orson Ellington and Ronaldo Malik. And we, as of, I want to say April 4th, we obtained the Miss Universe franchise, so Belize will be returning to Miss Universe for 2016. Our casting date is June 18th here at the Blist. We're doing an open call for girls all over the country um, for them to meet the requirements and, and come down and give it a shot to audition for the pageant. Uh, on July 22nd, we have our orientation and kickoff, which is going to be at Maruba Resort, one of our greatest sponsors. And the pageant itself is on the 10th of September here at the Bliss. Miss Belize is looking for new girls from all over the country to audition. Enriquez gave us the stats on where and when the auditions are going to take place and what kind of girls they are looking for. Uh, you must be between the ages of 18 and 26. Um, natural born female, never been convicted of a crime, never given birth to a child, or, um, and also not married. Must have a minimum of a high school diploma with college aspiration, and we're looking for someone with good character, good sports, with a good sense of sportsmanship. They definitely will have to uh, possess a certain level of stage presence, poise, eloquence, um, and, and joy. I want to see someone who is happy and confident in their own skin. Glamour and beauty patterns have come under criticism for focusing on women's physical attributes and lacking substance. Enriquez addressed the criticisms, stating that beauty pageants can be a source of women empowerment. A woman being confident in, in celebrating her beauty is a form of confidence. Um, and I think that's a form of power in itself. 
if you follow beauty pageants at all and look at the girls who participate and the ones who win their news anchors their doctors their attorneys their their dentists their um, social workers advocates for children they're really a, a collection of women who believe in their own success and have a genuine interest in contributing to society and I'm a former pageant participant. I also have a college degree. I raise a child who has special needs and I run a company. And I feel extremely empowered just by being born a woman, but with also everything that I accomplish and everything I'm going to accomplish. The end result that the Miss Belize universe is aspiring is to place in a major international beauty pageant. Enriquez is very confident that Belize could reach such heights. I really believe in the talent that's in this country. Um, I believe in the company that we've built and the uh, associations and partners that, partnerships that we've established. I believe in the work that we're doing and I believe in our young women. I, I have honestly no doubt that eventually we can bring home a major international title like Miss Universe. Enriquez stated that the Miss Belize Universe is receiving new funding and also they are looking for volunteers. Earlier we told you of Tanisha Plunkett, a mother of four young children ages one through five, who received a home from the Rotary Club of Belize. Tanisha's situation is not novel to Belize as many are familiar with the single mother phenomena where the fathers have either abandoned their children and or have failed to pay child support. The young mother told Love News today just after receiving her home where she will be living rent-free that she is seeking employment to be able to take care of her children. She also told Love News that she has sought child support via the Belize Family Court from the father of her children, but that has proved fruitless. No, ma'am. Honestly, no. Have you tried getting any kind of support? I miss you to go to family court and he not to pay no money. He, um, he used to work. As a cameraman, and we got to court. He agreed to pay maintenance, he paid twice. Up to now, you know, pay, say no to pay because they lose a job. It's still not to pay, you know, make no effort to give them one cent. So it's very hard. According to Tanisha, she has had experience in waitressing and is willing to work hard to provide for her children. The Nancy Marin Foundation has embarked on a social program called. Still I Rise, geared at helping primary school students from around the country. Yesterday saw the launch of the initiative with presentations made to upper level students at Grace Primary School in Belize City. I've always worked with youths in Cayo. The Nancy Marin Youth Foundation has about three years now of existence of doing different workshops and things to, to keep youths um, active and doing positive things. But the Still Arise campaign, um, we thought about it because in, in Cayo, as you know, we've had like several uh, suicide. We have numerous attempts that doesn't even reach to the media. We have children rebelling. And um, as we were just talking about earlier, parents, we, you know, when our first child is born, we don't get an instruction manual to know how to deal with these things. So the Still Arise campaign is twofold. Still I rise because to encourage both parents and children that it doesn't matter what they go through, the power is within us to rise above all of the struggles, to let them understand that the struggles are normal, we all go through them, but it is how we approach them and how we, we learn about what we're going through is the key. Education is the key, and this is why this conversation that we open up today at Grace is so important. It was important to open this conversation and to continue it. We're hoping that they will welcome us. We can't force ourselves, but we have offered it, and the schools that welcome us, we're going to come in and talk to them. But we will set out boots like on Market Day in Cayo and um, I believe in Belmopan and set out boots so that we can have information pamphlets and tell people where you can get help. Um, our website will be an interactive one where kids can go or parents can go log on and seek help with uh, professional counselors that will be online talking to you. So even if you physically cannot meet with one of us, you can do it online. 
Namte Marin conducted the presentation yesterday and told Love News that the students were very receptive. The reception was really good. The topics we covered was um, we couldn't speak too directly about self-harm because obviously administration is afraid of how the kids might react to that conversation. But we did talk about um, self-esteem and about having problems and issues at home or at school with you know teachers or other students and how to cope with it. What are the positive things you can do? But it was interesting to note that um, the topic of depression came out from the students. We didn't have to mention it. They started saying this, you know, when I'm depressed and this is why I get depressed. And so they started really talking to us about it. And we really learned a lot from, from what they said, like how they're going through. And they're very mature children for their age and they know what's going on. You know, now, now we just have to try to guide them as to how to deal with what is going on. But there, it was good. The initiative is a costly venture, but according to Marin, she has faith that it will all come together. The Nancy Marin Youth Foundation is funded primarily by myself and my husband, um, but also our volunteers from abroad or who bring in um, small donations, but they we accumulate, we put them up, and we, we tap into more human resources than financial, you know. Um, like Lewis, for example, he donates his time to us. He's one of our only local volunteers that donates his time to the center and do works that we don't have to pay for. He built the website. He does um, music classes and so the human resources is what help us for the programs to not cost so much but when it comes to the financial part it's myself and with the help of my volunteers. Natalie she is a um, psychology major and she is helping us with she she didn't help us prepare the program but she's help, helping us to deliver the program um, and she's volunteering she'll be here for one month and it's people like Natalie that donate their money as well for the programs to take place. A team from the United States is in Belize offering free eye care in southern Belize. Harry Arzu reports. Enrica residents and those from rural communities are taking advantage of free eye care service that is currently being offered by his servants ministries from Kentucky USA in partnership with the Belize Council for the Visually Impaired, BCVI. Dr. Lee Petlimsky told Love News that they are treating various eye-related illnesses and are also providing basic medication, including eyeglasses. He spoke with Love News. We're with the Fellowship of Christian Optometry and his servants' ministries. We're providing eye care in partnership with uh, BCVI, the Belize Council for the Visually Impaired. So we're here doing full eye exams to help people out with glasses and with eye medications. And if it turns out that they will need surgery, uh, we'll have some other teams that come later in the year that can help out with eye surgery. So we will find out if uh, eyeglasses are helpful for either seeing for distance or especially for reading. We're finding that a lot of folks need help with uh, reading vision to help read their Bibles and things like that. So we actually have those types of glasses available at no cost to the patients. And if um, they need sunglasses when they're working outdoors, if their lights are, if their eyes are very sensitive to light, we have some sunglasses available as well. And then for folks who maybe need some eye medications if they have glaucoma and they're on a prescription drop to help treat that, we can provide some of those medications as well. So we are treating glaucoma. We are identifying folks who have diabetic eye disease. Um, and we are finding folks with cataracts. In terms of ocular disease, those are probably the biggest three in this community. And with the glaucoma, we can treat it with eye drops. With the diabetes, we need to uh, inform the patient about proper follow-up care because that's not necessarily care that we're gonna provide today, but we can put them in touch with a doctor that will provide that care. And if they have cataracts, uh, many times cataracts will need surgery, and again, we're partnering with BCVI to get the patient in the health system to be able to obtain those surgeries. Yesterday, we were in Hopkins doing a similar outreach clinic. We saw about 101 patients there. Well, today, we're right here at the Red Cross in Dangriga. 
be here both today and tomorrow. Reporting for Love News from Benguiga, I'm Hari Azu. With the summer holidays quickly approaching, organizers from various institutions are preparing for the out-of-school programs. The Nancy Mervin Foundation for the 10th year will be holding its Camp Elevate in the rural part of the Cayo District. Love News spoke with Nancy Marin to get more details. For the meantime, for the summer, we have like Camp Elevate that people can come and, and participate in in Cayo. Um, Camp Elevate has a lot of different programs. We introduce like a new sport every year. We have boxing, archery, um, tutter ball, which I didn't know what that was last year, <laughs> wilderness therapy. So just new things that um, can open our children's minds and you know their eyes to new things that they might like instead of getting into drugs or, or listening to the wrong kind of music or looking at things on the internet. So we get all of these, um, they call it alternative therapies. So these therapists will come in during these camps and work with the children. Before it was done only in Georgeville, in Cayo, and we didn't invite anybody else. Um, last year, we opened it up to the country. So we had some people from Belmopan and the surrounding villages that came. Um, Camp Elevate seek to have the children do something positive and learn new things learn all kinds of new things. They, the wilderness therapist that came last year, she was from Chicago, and she deals with like children in gangs and stuff there and take them out in the wilderness and teach them to love nature and that kind of thing. And then we have Mr. Martinez who donates his time as a boxing trainer, and he comes in and teaches self-defense. Um, it's only a one week, and we accept children from the ages of six to 18, but these children are divided into groups per age, and the different therapists and uh, counselors that come in will take different groups of children. Camp begins on July 21st and it runs until July 28th. Excelsior High School, located on Faber's Road in Belize City, was recently engaged in a competition called Young, Green, and Clean. The competition had called for the students to make one item from recycled materials for entry. That is how it started until the students realized that there was even more potential than they had anticipated. School counselor Greta Jenkins spoke about the ongoing project and how they were able to come up with the materials. We decided when we were doing this, if we we're going to do one item, might as well we do more than one and try to uplift our school compound for the students. We have here a patio, we have lounge chairs, we have garbage bins, we have tables, we have, a, later on you'll see, we have a chair in there that we made from the plastic barrels that people ship stuff down in, from the states. We have mirrors made from spoons, um, purses made from chips bags, and um, most of the stuff, some of the stuff we bought, but one of the persons who donated the most to us was Benny's. They gave us a lot of tools and um, paints and also the Department of Youth Services donated paints and uh, most the pallets we had to buy and the tires we just got donated from tire shops from around the, the neighborhood here. The school, which has an open-door policy, accepts the students who are academically challenged or have behavior problems. Jenkins says that this initiative has allowed the students to enhance their self-esteem. Wow, this has made me especially proud of my students and I know it has lifted their self-esteem because a lot of them were not aware they had these talents because all these um, cushions and things, they were sewn by the students. You know, everything was the graffiti, the painting, everything was done by the students so I think it has lifted their self-esteem because a school like this here at Excelsior we do not discriminate if a student gets 12 on a PSE we accept them here and sometimes they're not good academically but they have skills and when they see that they're good at something it builds their self-esteem you know because since we have done this well the students they hardly want to be in, in the classroom they want to come outside to have class and all of that so it's hard to keep them inside now in the classroom building. The competition ends on June 10th when a winner will be announced. Our thought conditioner for today comes from Ann Landers. It reads, quote, 
Some people believe holding on and hanging in there are signs of great strength. However, there are times when it takes much more strength to know when to let go and then do it. End of quote. This has been the Evening News on Love Television and we invite you to log on to our website at www.lovefm.com for the transcripts of our news stories. Thank you for joining us. Have a safe and enjoyable evening. I am Karen Butcher.